Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. We have more Dynasty Duels breakdown. This time we go way back to 1986. Iowa had five champions, six in the finals, eight All-Americans, and we're talking with one of those champions. He's the current head wrestling coach at Iowa State. Kevin Dresser, thanks for joining us. Hey, Kyle, thanks. This is uh, unprecedented times if we're talking about this stuff, right? Well, it's fun, though. I mean, this is a yeah. great team, five champions. First time in the history – of the Division One NCAA championships to have five champions. Did you know going in that you were going to have a great team like this? Yeah, you know, first off, it's kind of nice to be talking about something different. So uh, I didn't expect this interview. So, yeah, kind of going back, um, you know, obviously you're prejudiced to your own um, teams in your own era. But, yeah, this, that, that was a great team. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that you took eight, just eight guys qualified for the NCAA tournament and all eight guys ended up in the top five in the nation and six ended up in the finals and five winning. Um, I don't know if that was, the, you know, the greatest team ever, but for three days, it's probably arguably one of the best uh, performances of any team team ever. And again, I'm, I'm prejudiced. But. And then go down to 118, you had a, you didn't even have anyone at the Big Ten championships. Yeah, 118 in heavyweight, we didn't qualify that year, right? So, yeah, you send eight, and you guys had to have known that you guys had a great team because the year before you guys had dominated, and you had a lot of those guys back. Probably the expectation was that you guys were going to clean house at some level. Yeah, you know, we had a really, really good year. Um, I think the only guy we did lose was Barry Davis. and Obviously, he was phenomenal. So I think he was the only guy that we lost there. And then, you know, we ended up replacing him with Penrith, who went on to win that year and be in the finals for – three times but yeah we had a really good duel the the uh kind of the ironic thing of that season was is our last dual meet of the year just like it used to be back in the day Iowa, Iowa State always wrestled twice once in January and once in you know the last dual meet before the big tens and big eights back then um we came to Hilton Coliseum and um and Iowa State beat us at Hilton um, Jim Gibbons is I think first year at Iowa State and uh, they beat us and so we went into the Big Ten championship, you know, with a, our last, our last uh, performance was a was a dual meet loss. So to think about that, and then to go on and, and you know, I think that we, I think that '86 team still has the record for biggest margin of victory ever, you know. Uh, so um, it just shows you that, you know, like I said at the beginning, one one weekend you got, you know, you got eight guys who were really dialed in. Did it ever cross you that it was? You were going against Jim Gibbons, who you likely knew pretty well at that point. He was 25 or 26 at the time. Did that seem strange at all? Probably now it does because I've been on the other side as a coach for so many years. Yeah, so for uh, you know a program like Iowa State to turn it over to a 25 or 26-year-old guy um, was probably pretty unusual. But obviously Jim showed that he did a great, great job and was a great coach and uh, – you know, I had obviously uh, I had a lot of history with the Gibbons boys because Joe and I wrestled each other all the way through high school and, and through college. And so um, just funny how life works out. And, and I'm here and and, you know, those two guys have really been instrumental in us uh, uh, having success, you know, at Iowa State, even these last three years. So but Jim, Jim, yeah, I still have seen I don't know a couple of years ago, somebody showed me the video of that dual meet, just the end of the dual, dual meet. And uh, seeing uh, Joe and the guys from Iowa State carry Jim around Hilton Coliseum, um, obviously they hadn't beat Iowa for quite a while at that, to at that time. A guy that I think maybe is the most underrated Iowa wrestler ever is Marty Kistler, a guy that's a three-time finalist, three different weights, places second to Kenny Monday in 1984, wins it in 85, and then OW with a dominant performance in 1986. Why do you think Marty Kistler doesn't get brought up like he should? Probably because there just was so many, especially during those periods, there was so many multiple-time NCAA champs at Iowa. So you just get lumped in there, you know. You, you got Jimmy Zaleski who just had left and Barry Davis and, um, gosh, uh, you know, and then you, you roll into the next era of uh, the brands. And so there's just, you know, there was this span there where, you know, there was all kinds of multiple national champs at Iowa, and I think that's probably why you might get lost in that conversation a little bit. What was he like, though? What did he bring to the team? Jeez, that dude was – he was super physical, super tough. Um, you know, he kind of got thrown to the Wolves uh, his first year. You know, he didn't get a redshirt year. So he kind of got thrown to the Wolves in probably, what, 81, 82. 
and, and struggled, made the NCAA tournament, but did an All-American and then came back and just was on fire, you know. And uh, super physical, super tough guy. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, being smaller, I, you know, the few times I did wrestle Marty, it wasn't fun. All right, if we have a room and we put in Royce Alger, Rico Ciparelli, and Brad Penrith, what's going to happen there? Shoo. Give me a lot of stories told, first off. Um, you know, I think the whole thing about that now that I'm coaching and see all that is, that, you know, I always tell our guys now that, you know, in order to be great, you got to be really good and really tough. Um, and, and those three guys, you know, kind of fit into that whole whole team, you know. Uh, um, Royce was probably known, you know, Royce, you know, really that particular year, Royce got fifth. And um, probably the one thing that, that uh, you know, he had, to, he had to go to 158 because he had Marty Kistler at 167. And probably the one thing that Royce brought to the table that we saw, you know, when he won his two national titles, and then when he went on to be a good uh, Olympic wrestler, was Royce was so physical. In that particular year, just by, you know, no choice, he had to go to 58. So Royce was cutting a crazy amount of weight to make 158, and and uh, and and that probably took some of Royce's mojo away. And Royce's mojo was his just his physicality and his his, his uh, just run you over and maul you. And so you know when you cut that much weight, you're going to take strength from a guy. And I think he proved later on, you know, the next two years, he kind of just ran through Division One wrestling because he was so physical. Um, so and then you got Penrith and Rico that are more, um, you know, those guys were really really good wrestlers too. Uh, um, I mean, their their style was a little different. Um, you know, they'd pick you apart and slick you a little bit more than Royce. Royce would just run you over and beat the crap out of you. Well, you think about that team, though. There's a lot of head coaches that came out of that. Brad Penrith was a head coach at UNI. You, Dwayne Goldman was on that team. Uh, don't know if I'm missing anyone there. But, yeah, you got uh, Heffer Heffern and Randall, too, you know. So those yeah, guys were, right. you know, Greg, Greg Randall was – Greg Randall was super tough, and he uh, did a great job at Boise for years. And, of course, Heff's doing a great job at, uh, at Illinois. So, yeah, you got a lot of guys that stayed around wrestling. And Goldman and I were roommates for a lot of years in college, and, um, you know, we still keep up and we're close. So, yeah, that was a fun, fun group. Do you think that's because of the Gable influence that they got into coaching like that and you too? Yeah, probably. I think, you know, not that it's that much different now, but back then, um, you know, wrestling was just really uh, important to to those guys in 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 that era and that generation. I mean, wrestling was was our life, and not saying it's right or wrong, but there wasn't as much emphasis on school and and uh, you know back then than there is now, and in all the academic requirements. So you could train, and for the guys that really you could really really train and just train, and then for the guys that really like to train, uh, you know, what a better place to be than in Iowa City back then. What was the room like on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, what was the vibe? What was the flavor? Um, you know, I think the, the, I think the beauty of Gable was is that he was able to put together such a strong environment. Um, uh, you know, of course, back then, Gable was on the mat just about every day, too. So just looking over and watching the guy uh, train himself uh, on a daily basis was, was, was uh, motivational. But just putting together an environment, you know, guys back then especially came to Iowa just to be in that kind of crazy training environment. I always tell tell our guys that, you know, a typical practice, uh, the practices didn't vary much back then. You got warmed up, you got a partner, you started drilling, and you wrestled for about an hour and 15 minutes straight, um, hour and a half straight, and then you finished with some, some type of sprints or conditioning. And that was Monday, and that was Tuesday, and that was Wednesday, and that was Thursday. Um, I don't think we could do that anymore. So you don't think these guys today could really? Uh, no, and I'm not. That? I'm not picking on this generation. I think you know. I think kids are probably maybe bigger, faster, stronger a little bit. So maybe the bodies just wouldn't hold up. But uh, you know, I think if you tried to train like that right now, um, you'd be lucky to pull ten guys together at the end of the year, uh, for whatever reason. I don't know what it is, um, but I know that uh, it, it was a grind. But then when that's but that's when that's all you know, you just assume that's the norm. I really don't know what other teams were doing back then because that's all we did. I don't know what Penn State was doing. I don't know what Oklahoma State was doing. I don't know what Iowa State was doing. I don't know what their 3.30 to 5.30 looked like every day. I just knew what we were doing. When you look back at it and you look at your personal career, you didn't 
Russell as far as the starter there for the first couple of years, then got fourth and then got the championship as a senior. How was your progression? How did you get to that level where you got good and won a championship? You know, it was super competitive. And, you know, I, I lost one year, uh, didn't make the team because of Lenny Zaleski. And then one year, a guy named Jeff Kerber, which both those guys were four-time All-Americans. I think Lenny might have been a fourth, second, second. So it wasn't easy, you know, and I knew what I signed up for. I knew when I went there that I was going to have to uh, uh, grind it out uh, to make the team. And so I wasn't a blue, blue chip guy, but I was a pretty, you know, highly recruited guy at high school. Um, so, um you know, with an injury in a redshirt year and, and losing to a couple guys that were pretty darn good, that had pretty good careers, um, you know, I was chomping at the bit to get in there and be the guy. Um, you know, I got I was seeded second uh, my first year at the NCAA tournament. Uh, I got the second seed and, and got upset in the semis and got fourth. So um, I was ready. You know, I was ready. It was just was it just wasn't my time before then. But you know, I, I had to get better wrestling. I think I had the tank and I had the toughness, but I just had to get better wrestling. Um, and so as I got better wrestling day in and day out, um, you know, when it was my turn, I was ready to go. Who were you closest with on the team? Um, you know, I think at that time you're close with everybody. You know, I ended up being in Dwayne Goldman's wedding. I ended up being in Brad Penner's wedding. Um, um, you know, was was close with with just about all of those guys at that time. Lived with Marty Kistler at one point. Lived with, uh, you know, like I said, lived with Goldman. Um, um so, yeah, I think at that time when you're in the trenches, you're close with all those guys. And even though you might have differences and you might not have hung out with, uh, with all of them day in and day out, you, you respected them. You know, uh, Jim Heffernan and Greg Randall were – you shoot those guys. Heffernan was a three-time finalist. Randall was a two-time finalist. I think that's the thing about that team is everybody on that – all those eight guys that placed that year were all in the finals at least once. And a lot of them were in the finals multiple times. So that's a pretty good, pretty good group of guys. You were with the program in a year that Iowa won every single year. What's the art to Dan Gable's legacy? How did he do it? Yeah, I always kid around. I got five rings. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to keep my hands on all five of them, but uh, I, I was on five uh, NCAA championship teams. That's, that's my claim to fame, but no. Um, you know, I just think environment. I think, uh, I think you know, a great role model uh, that, that Dan Gable was, just the way that he approached the sport, he lived his life. And, you know, to me, I was just always amazed at just watching him work out and, and, and looking over to the left and looking over to the right and seeing what he did day to day. Uh, that was motivational uh, enough for me. But then um, whether he recruited them or whether guys came and found Iowa, it was just such a unique environment then that, you know, he didn't have to scream and yell a lot. He didn't have to blow the whistle a lot. Um, he just said, let's, you know, we're going to, after we get warmed up, we're going to go live. And, and the show just took over. And, and, uh, and, and the uh, intensity and the, and the desire to be, to be really great as a, as a team and as individuals, everybody just fed off everybody. What coaching principles did he implement into you that you still use? I think just that. I think, you know, just, I think when you try to, when you try to put together the very best room you can and the most competitive room you can, you're going to, you're going to climb the ranks. And, um, you know, I know when I started at Virginia tech and now when we're here at Iowa state, you know, when you have a good competitive room and you got guys, um, scrapping to the point of borderline fist fight and making sure you stay on the right side of it and step on that line every now and then, I think when you get that kind of competitiveness in the room, um, and guys calling each other out three and four days early, lining stuff up, uh, that's what I remember is that you know, I can remember kind of being an older guy leaving and coming back and guys like the Steiners and Brands would literally fight to, to, to get you to, on their agenda for the week. Um, that's a competitive environment. When you think about this as a whole in 86, is it still pretty special to, to be an individual NCAA champion and have a, a dominant team like that? Yeah, I think this, you know, shoot, every every kid that wrestles wants to win an NCAA title. So yeah, that'll always be with you, and and hang on and and, and be a part of who you are if you if you win an NCAA championship. But it's cool to be, you know, the, the team thing's fun. I mean, it's fun to win individually, but when you get to go up there, you know, five years in a row and pick up a trophy late on Saturday night, uh, you develop a bond with those guys, and uh, um, especially when you get to pick up the gold one, the, the number one one. And so, you, gosh, you kind of take it for granted because I think we had it 
every year that I was there, the, the team title was, was wrapped up before, a lot of times before Saturday morning, but definitely uh, by three o'clock on Saturday. So it was, uh, you know, we won what the ninth straight one in 86. And so there, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of titles at that time. Take us through your upcoming schedule here for Iowa State. You got a couple cool things. You got Wartburg coming in, and then you have this dual meet against Purdue in Humboldt. Take us through those two dual meets and what that means for your program. Well, first off, the Humboldt dual meet is is still tentative. It looks like it's going to happen. We still have to get the blessing of the Big Ten schedule. Um, I think if we've agreed that even if that date doesn't work, we we um, we're going to work to find an alternative date. But that isn't completely done yet. It's just a tentative thing, but it, it looks good. Um, um, but, you know, Tony's a humble guy, um, and um, I'm a humble guy. And so we thought, well, you know, this would be good for wrestling to bring some – to bring a big-time college dual meet up to northwest Iowa, which has always had good tradition of wrestling. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, that's going to be on a Sunday afternoon. I think Humboldt's going to try to wrestle somebody before that, so there will be a doubleheader that day. Um, and then, you know, I thought Wartburg would be cool. I thought that would be cool to wrestle a powerhouse at, at, the, at the Division two, II, three, or JUCO level. And, um, um, and we actually tried to work out a deal with Grandview. But uh, for what their schedule and our schedule, we couldn't get it to work. So we're going to maybe – Coach Mitchell and I are going to try to maybe do something like that the following year. But I reached out to Coach Keller, and he was all over right away and said, let's do something a little different and kick the season off. And so don't have, again, the official day, but it looks like it's going to be one of the, the first Friday in November. So it looks like it's probably how we'll both kick off our season. Is there a good buzz going in Humboldt about that duel? Oh, yeah, they're fighting for tickets now. We've got to figure out how the heck we're going to sell tickets for that event because uh, um, it's. I think the good news is it's got a big gym. It's got a balcony. I think they can hold 1,700. So um, uh, I think that's their biggest challenge right now is figuring out how to do that. But our ticket office will – work with them and figure it out and I'm sure it'll be a good good fun event humble fans <clears throat> I always say I, I think uh, we got over 125 season tickets just from Humboldt County here at Iowa State so humble people have been great I always hear this when you're head coach it's more being CEO of the program rather than head coach do you feel like that's your role being CEO of the Iowa State program yeah I think so I think you got to be able to do it all and delegate and jump in here and there and Sometimes you jump in and, and lead by example, and sometimes you you know you delegate it out. Um, I think we have a good mix. I got especially two young guys that uh, are my right hand guys, and, and Coach St. John and Coach Metcalf. Um, so I've got uh, I think I've got a good situation. We've got a great director of operations who I brought from Virginia Tech, and then you know we've got young guys in the program that are helping out that are still training, like uh, you know like Willie Miklas and Joey Palmer, and you know obviously Kyvin's been important and. You know, getting a guy like Nate Carr in the RTC, Nate brings so much to the table. You know, being an Iowa State guy and being just a, such a motivational uh, leader in, in all areas. Um, so, and I don't want to start naming too many names because I'll forget people, but it, it does. It, it, if you look at it like a CEO, it takes a lot of people uh, to, um, to, put, to put together a really good program. And it was no different than when I was a high school coach at, you know, Grundy High School when I was a high school coach at Christiansburg High School. We couldn't have had success without – without the people uh, in the program and you, you, you know, everybody's got a role. And if you, as the boss, if you can get everybody buying into their role, uh, you got a chance to win and do great things, you know, and same thing at Virginia Tech, you know, the best thing I did was hire a guy like Tony Roby and uh, the, you know, the coaches that I had at Virginia Tech were awesome. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's part of the job. Do the athletes feed off of Nate Carr's energy? Oh, yeah, every now and then, Nate, will, uh, you know, we'll do some uh, kind of away from, like, regional training center stuff and some motivational stuff. And you get Nate up there and you got to tie him down because he can't stay behind the podium. He's, he's all over the place. So he's, uh, he's invested and uh, he's just a good resource for guys to talk to, too. Um, you know, just an important piece of our puzzle. Well, thanks for taking time with us. This was your first ever Zoom call, so we appreciate yeah. being the first one for that. But thanks for reflecting on the 86 team and wish you all the best with this upcoming season. Yep. Thanks, Kyle.